Great. Thanks so much. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a bit strange to be giving a talk in this format, but hopefully uh, you'll all get to see the slides and enjoy it. Uh, today I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about some of the work we've been up to trying to look at irrational behavior in non-human primates um, with the kind of striking title of Are Humans More Irrational Than Monkeys? And just to get a sense of what I wanted to talk about today, um, I first wanted to uh, introduce you guys to uh, questions in primate cognition, why it, what primate cognition is, uh, since I bet some of you uh, might find this field a bit new. Um, and then I'll tell you some of the economic biases that we've been trying to see, uh, whether if we can see them in humans, whether we can also find similar biases in non-human primates. Um, and then if we have time at the end, we'll sort of talk a little bit about what we can learn from monkeys and have time for questions, too. Um, but first, an introduction to primate cognition. Um, the field of primate cognition, I think, is really out to address a particular big question. And it's a big question that I think scientists face, but it's also one that we face just as lay people, particularly as lay people trying to get to know new people for the first time. So imagine that right now we were going to stop this webinar and just have a conversation to try to get to know each other. The question is, what kinds of questions would you want to ask about one another? You know, what would you want to ask me to learn something about me for the first time? And I bet if I were to ask you guys this question now, one of the big questions that would come up, the kind of thing you typically ask one another to get to know each other, is the following question, this question of sort of, where are you from? Now, I grew up in New Bedford, Massachusetts. I've been living in New Haven for the past eight years, yada, yada. Really, what does this question do? Well, figuring out where somebody's from actually tells us something really important about what they're really like. If you find out that I'm from the West Coast or the East Coast, it's going to tell you something causally about who I am as a person right now. If you find out I grew up on the very same street that you grew up on, we're going to have some shared background that's going to even affect us as adults today. And so this question about where are we from is a truly important one for trying to get to know how somebody ticks. The claim I'm going to make throughout the talk today is that understanding where we are from, from a cognitive level, is going to be equally important. If we really want to understand the mechanisms that make up the human mind, we're going to need to know a little bit about where those mechanisms come from in the first place. And the good news is that we have two good empirical ways of getting at this issue. The first empirical way of getting at this issue is actually taking an ontogenetic approach or a developmental approach and trying to figure out where the mechanisms of the mind come from in ontogenetic time. And of course, developmental psychologists uh, have long used this sort of method to get at the origins of cognition, studying how very, very young babies make sense of the world, and how these cognitive abilities change and adapt over the life course. So kind of one way to answer this question of where are you from. But there's a second way to answer this question of where are you from, and that's the way that, that we've done it in our lab, and that's to take an evolutionary approach. Um, in the best of all worlds, we'd be able to study the guys you see there on your screen. They're trying to figure out, say, what, what this guy, uh, most distantly related primate in the group might know about the world, and how that understanding might change as we move across phylogenetic development uh, to modern day humans. Of course, this would be a fantastic empirical approach, except there's a big problem with it. Uh, the problem, as you might have identified, is that the guys you would most want as your subjects are actually all dead. Um, and so to take a more phylogenetic approach to this question of where we came from, we actually have to use a bit of a proxy. And the proxy that we've been using in our own lab is to actually turn to the living non-human primates uh, to get a sense of uh, how they make sense of the world. And just to give you a kind of fast introduction to the primate tree, here's a very uh, Yale-centric version of the primate order. I'm here at Yale University, and so uh, this is our version um, with the human being represented here as the Yale undergraduate. Um, perhaps some of you guys might recognize this particular Yale undergraduate, and uh, that's to remind us that, of course, evolution isn't a branching uh, or sort of a ladder with humans on top. You know, it's kind of a branching tree with all of us across there. Uh, but our lab has been focused on studying the three most distantly related branches of primates. We actually study a group of lemurs down at the Mayaka City Lemur Reserve. Um, we actually have fantastic access to five different lemur species over at the reserve. And we can kind of get up close and personal with them and study what they know about the world, what these lemur species know about the world um, out there in the forest in a sort of naturalistic habitat. And that gives us this great window into the most distantly related group of primates. 
We've also been studying, and you'll hear a lot about today, uh, the most distantly related branch of monkeys. These are the New World monkeys represented here by the brown capuchin monkey. We actually study a group of brown capuchin monkeys here on campus at Yale, um, and that allows us to study them in a captive setting where we can kind of train them um, and really kind of develop new tasks to understand their social cognition. So here's James, one of our monkeys, uh, kind of looking longingly at a grape. So that's the capuchin setup. Uh, the third group we work with are, is this branch here. This is the branch of Old World monkeys uh, represented here by the rhesus macaque. Um, just for full disclosure, our lab also studies a group of rhesus macaques at a different field reserve. Um, this is the island of Cayo Santiago, which is right off the coast of Puerto Rico. Um, and it's home to a thousand free-ranging rhesus monkeys. You can see kind of running around the island here. Um, we're also able to go down to this field reserve and study the rhesus monkeys directly. Um, just are setting tasks up out in the in the field site um, to get at what they know about the world. And so so that's sort of the approach that my lab takes in your kind of whirlwind introduction to primate cognition. Really the goals of this whole approach are to actually do exactly what developmental psychologists do over developmental time um, across phylogenetic time. Really comparing the top branches of the phylogenetic tree, the kinds of capacities we see and the capacities these individuals lack to try to get some understanding of how cognition changed across human evolution and, and across the primate order in particular. And so with that goal in mind, a lot of the work that we've been up to really kind of looks like this, sort of trying to ask the question of how non-human primates think about the world and whether their thinking looks anything like that of the human species. And this has been a, a long-standing approach in the field of primate cognition typically kind of picking some capacity that humans do that's incredibly smart and asking the question about whether or not non-human primates share that capacity. The history of this approach started with Robert Yerkes and colleagues asking um, questions as varied as to trying to figure out about primate tool use, trying to understand whether primates represent different kinds of things. It extended into the uh, early language work, trying to teach chimpanzees language, asking again this question of whether or not chimpanzees had this very, very smart capacity uh, that humans have, namely the capacity to do language. And the history of this work in primate cognition has, in, has been impressive and interesting. So for example, on the screen here, I have a picture of uh, whether rhesus monkeys are thinking about numerical events in the same way as people. And what we're starting to learn is that in many of the cases where psychologists actually study smarter capacities in non-human primates, we often tend to see rudiments of the capacities we see in humans. So in the case of numerical cognition, um, as, as some of you may know, there's lots of work suggesting that non-human primates may have some limited capacity to represent number, um, representing small exact numbers up to about four, um, and uh, more noisy numerical representations, um, if even bigger numbers. It seems like these are the kinds of capacities that might be older over evolutionary time uh, and potentially shared with other infants. Again, this hint that at least some of the aspects of the smarter capacities we have as humans, we might see shared with non-human primates. The same sort of thing has happened in the physical domain, um, trying to look at whether or not non-human primates share some physical notions that we have when we think about functional tools. And this work, again, has revealed this, this interesting uh, case where even though many non-human primate species do not use tools, such as the case of these lemurs here, they can be trained to use simple physical objects. And once they're trained, they actually seem to understand some aspects of the functional properties of those objects. Uh, so my students and I, for example, have found that lemurs seem to recognize which features of a tool are good for their function. So they seem, seem to pay attention to information about shape and texture and size, ignoring irrelevant information like the color of the tools. Again, suggesting that one of these smart capacities that we have as humans, the capacity to recognize which aspects of an object are important for their function, seem to be shared uh, broadly across the primate order. So that's sort of numerical cognition, physical cognition. This approach of looking at the smarter capacities in humans and non-human primates has also been extended to the social domain, um, especially in recent work trying to look at whether or not non-human primates can actually think about the minds of other individuals. And this work, too, has revealed rudimentary understandings and rudimentary smart capacities um, in pretty distantly related primates. Just to give one example, my students and I uh, have been studying the extent to which non-human primates, particularly rhesus macaques, can actually represent what other individuals see. And so we've given rhesus monkeys at the Cayo Santiago field station problems that look like this, where they have the opportunity to steal one of two grapes from human experimenters who you can see. 
And as you can see on the screen, what, what, the, what differs between the two experiments is whether or not one of the individuals is actually looking at the monkey in question. And what we and others have found is that this, uh, the monkeys seem to use information about what others see when they're trying to deceive other individuals. And so rhesus monkeys, in this case, for example, would steal from the person who wasn't looking. They'd steal this grape right here. You can see my mouse moving. Um, they'd actually steal from individuals whose eyes were blocked, who didn't know where information was. They seem to represent others' mental states, uh, the mental states of seeing and knowing um, in a lot of the same way as humans do. And so that was just a fast whirlwind tour from a lot of the work coming out of the field of primate cognition, suggesting that non-human primates share, at least in a rudimentary way, some of the smarter capacities that we see in humans, both in the physical and the social domain. And this, by and large, has been the way that the field of primate cognition has gone since its earliest inception, really just asking, can we see aspects of the, species of the human species in non-human primates? This was the spot where we got started on our own work on irrationality pointing out the question of, well, yes, it's interesting to actually use non-human primates as a model to figure out where human smarter capacities came from. But our students and I started to think that it might be just as useful to actually turn to non-human primates to figure out where some of the not-so-smart capacities come from, um, some of our irrational tendencies or biases, um, if you'll forgive me making fun of the Yale undergraduate one more time. But of course, what we know as psychologists is that you know, human capacities can be incredibly smart and incredibly impressive. Uh, but we're also a species that's subject to a lot of systematic biases, a lot of errors in the face even of information and training. And so what we wanted to do was to start exploring the evolutionary origins of these kinds of uh, strategies or these kinds of biases. Could it be that humans aren't the only species that's subject to some of these biases? And what can we learn about how some of these biases work by studying non-human primates? And that was what sort of launched our, our initial exploration of uh, non-human primate biases, or capuchin monkey errors. Um, and because of the time we started, this was around uh, 2005, 2006, it was just around the time of the financial collapse where lots of folks were talking about human financial errors. This was what sort of led us to start by asking, well, can we actually see some of these seemingly predictable errors uh, that, that are often observed in human? Can we start to see some of these kinds of errors uh, in non-human primates as well? And so we decided to embark on a research program where we started to look for whether or not uh, capuchin monkeys in particular shared human-like economic biases. And this is actually work that I started uh, to, you know, here at Yale University, sort of making fun of the Yale undergraduate again. But it was all done in collaboration uh, with, with two other scholars here. Uh, the first is Keith Chen, who's a professor at the Yale School of Management. He's an economist by training. Um, it was really important in this work uh, where we tr were really trying to uh, study non-human primate decision making from a really economic uh, level of analysis. Uh, so we did this work in collaboration with Keith um, and also with then Kat Lakshman Ryanon, who's a graduate student here at Yale who did a lot of this stuff for his dissertation work. And so Keith and then Kat and I got together and tried to figure out whether or not we could actually design methods to study economic decision making in capuchin monkeys. Um, and probably at least most of you out there don't work with capuchin monkeys, but as you could probably guess, Capuchin monkeys don't naturally use money, and so we had a bit of a methodological challenge ahead of us. Uh, the way we solved this particular methodological challenge, though, was to just introduce the capuchin monkeys that we have uh, here at Yale to their own form of fiat currency. Um, it looks something like this. Uh, these are these monkey tokens that we developed and introduced to the monkeys, teaching them that they could actually trade these tokens uh, for pieces of food. And so functionally, what we tried to do was to develop a currency that the Capuchins recognize uh, as a fiat currency, as one that they could trade flexibly with humans for food. Um, we weren't sure when we embarked on this work um, how quickly the monkeys would pick this up. But the surprising thing is that they actually got it quite quickly. Um, this is sort of what it looks like uh, when the monkeys get good at this. Here's Mayday, one of our Capuchins. Um, she enters her testing enclosure. And you can see on the bottom there, she has a little wallet of tokens. Um, and if you look across the different timestamps there, that's her sort of swapping the token over into the hand of the human experimenter. Turned out it took about uh, two training stages to get the monkeys to do this. The monkeys who see the tokens for the first time spontaneously pick them up. Um, and then uh, when you were to show the monkeys a person holding a piece of food uh, in their hand, they get very curious about this piece of food. And across one or two trials of actually swapping, of the experimenter kind of grasping the token from the monkey, 
the monkeys quickly pick this up and get the concept of exchange. Um, and so here's just a short video of what this looks like. Uh, here's Felix, one of our alpha males, we're training the token to get a piece of food. Um, you just see a couple guys. Here's Jill, one of our adult females. And so you kind of get the idea that the upshot is that the monkeys actually get very good at this, um, trading tokens with human experimenters, individual human experimenters. Having trained just this into the monkeys, we wanted to ask whether or not they were treating this trading situation um, like a real economic exchange. And to do this, to test this question, what we did was to put the monkeys into their own market. Now they were about to trade not just with a single experimenter who was offering food, but different experimenters who offered different kinds of foods at different prices. And so this is what we uh, lovingly refer to as our own primate market. Um, as I said, it, it works when the monkeys can enter the enclosure and get a little wallet of 12 tokens, just as you saw before. Um, and they're going to be interacting with different traders, usually two different experimenters, different undergraduates in the lab who are wearing different clothes um, and offering different foods at different prices. And the general methods go something like this. Um, the monkey would enter the testing enclosure for testing and get her wallet of tokens. Um, and then she'd see these two undergraduate traders move to either side of the enclosure. And importantly, each of the traders would then show the food um, that the monkey could buy. And the amount of food that the, monkey, that the trader displayed is the amount of food that the monkey could get uh, for a single token. So the amount of food displayed, in some sense, becomes the price of that food. Uh, getting larger pieces of food or more food is actually better for your, the monkey's token dollar than smaller amounts of food. So each trader would show uh, the food that would be traded, and then the monkey would be allowed to make a choice. Namely, he'd just kind of hand over a token to one of the two experimenters. Um, that trader who was paid would deliver the food. The trader would then swap sides randomly, and then this process would repeat until the monkey spent all of their tokens. Um, what this allowed us to do was to look at how many of the 12 tokens the monkey spent on each of the two experimenters. Functionally, what we were getting here is a, a measure of the monkey's willingness to pay across the two goods, the two experimenters, and the two prices. And so the first question we had was whether or not the monkeys are actually treating this uh, like a market. Um, are they actually uh, paying attention to the prices, the risk, and the reliability of the different experimenters? And so uh, what we did to test that was to sort of start a set of studies trying to look at whether the market works. I'll tell you just about one, but if you have uh, questions about it, I'd be happy to answer more about how we kind of tested these things out. But here's, here's one of the first studies we did, um, which is that we'd introduced the monkey uh, to one novel trader. So this is Kirk. And as you can see, Kirk seems to be holding uh, what the food is, which is a single grape. So the monkeys are going to get a single grape for their token. Um, the monkeys actually like grapes um, a lot, and so this is a pretty good deal. Um, and I'm seeing a question on the, the chat screen asking about um, whether we only used uh, desired food, typically because these were treats that the monkeys were getting. They were often foods that the monkeys actually liked a lot. Um, but we varied in studies the quality of the food from kind of kind of slightly liked foods to very, very liked foods. Grapes are on the order of things that they like a lot. So the monkeys would meet Kirk and realize that he sells uh, one grape per token. Um, but then the monkeys would also get to meet Justin. And they could see uh, from trading with Justin, who's the experimenter in purple, uh, that he's offering two grapes per token. And so in some sense, he's twice as good a deal as trading uh, with Kirk. And so the question is, individually, the monkeys are introduced across the session uh, to Kirk and to Justin. Then the question is, um, if they get a choice between the two, will they selectively shop uh, at Justin? Um, and so here's a short video of what this looks like. Here's uh, Honey, who's one of our monkeys. She's kind of impatiently waiting for the market to open. But then finally, the market opens, um, and the monkeys get their choice, one grape or two. And you can see uh, Honey shops at Justin. Um, in fact, most of the monkeys uh, we work with ended up shopping at Justin at rates of about 80 or 90 percent across 50 trials each. Um, the monkeys are showing a whopping statistical preference to shop at Justin. Um, so this was just one of the many studies uh, we did to try to validate whether or not the, the market works. The upshot is that um, across a lot of the different situations in which humans are relatively rational, so calculating expected value across risk, um, calculating expected value across amount in small amounts, uh, the, the monkeys were pretty rational as well. Um, Keith Chen in, in, in a uh, paper in the Economics Journal also was able to quantify the monkeys' uh, behavior across price shifts. And what we found in that case is that the monkeys actually rationally respond to sales 
Um, and if you plot, uh, if you try to model the monkey's behavior using standard economic models, the models look uh, rational in a lot of the same ways as humans are rational. Um, so the exciting thing for us was that for a lot of these uh, extents and purposes, the monkeys actually seemed um, to be using their token economy in ways that were reasonable measures of their own willingness to pay. And this allowed us to do uh, kind of what we really wanted was to actually start looking at some of the more irrational behaviors in the species. And to sort of see some of these irrational behaviors in action, we'll now turn to some of the ways that humans are irrational when they're asked about their own economic exchanges. And so here's one uh, famous example of human irrationality uh, that comes from some early studies of Danny Kahneman and, and Drisky and colleagues. And here's how this goes. So imagine you're given a survey uh, in which you're asked, you're allowed to have the following option. You are given $1,000 seems great, um, but you have to make a choice. Your choice is how to obtain some more money, so it's a pretty good choice. Uh, your first option is to take a risk, which means I'll flip a coin, and if it comes up heads, you get $1,000 more, but tails, you'll only you'll get nothing. So that's the risky option to gaining more money. Uh, your other option is to choose to play it safe, in which case you don't have to flip a coin, you just get $500 more with certainty. And so if you guys uh, had your mics on, I would ask you and do a big survey of which of you uh, would take a risk and which of you would play it safe. Um, if many of you are like Princeton undergraduates who are tested, you're probably looking at this option and thinking, hmm, it might make sense to play it safe. At rates of about 70%, people choose to go with the certain option here. Now, there's nothing irrational about that. That's just people tending to be a little bit risk averse. What is irrational, though, is what happens in, to people's preferences in a very, very similar scenario that's framed slightly differently. And so now, thanks all, many of you are chiming in what you would do, and I've seen lots of play it safe, so that's great. Uh, but now, imagine uh, we're taking a slightly different uh, set of choices. So now we have a scenario in which you're given $2,000. This seems a lot better, except now you have to decide how you want to lose some money. Um, but you have the same choice. You could either lose some money by taking a risk. I'll flip a coin, uh, and it'll either come up heads or tails. If it comes up heads, you lose more. Tails, you lose nothing. Um, so you could take a risk, or you could choose to play it safe, which means you'll just lose $500 with certainty. Now, if you're like Princeton undergraduates uh, who experience both of these scenarios, you might be finding yourself smirking right now, because perhaps your intuition here is that now this risky option uh, isn't seeming so bad anymore. And in fact, at rates of about 70%, uh, undergraduates tend to choose to play it risky when they're dealing with losses. Um, the reason this is irrational, of course, is that if you do the math on these two scenarios, the outcomes are the same from the top scenario to the bottom scenario. Um, so it raises the question of why do people decide to be more risky when they're dealing with losses? Why do people show different preferences depending on how the, the scenario is framed? And this has led uh, behavioral economists to come up with at least a few different biases um, that seem to be uh, controlling people's behavior here. The first of these biases is what's known as reference point setting or reference dependence. And this is just the idea that we don't seem to evaluate our choices in terms of absolutes. We tend to see our options not in terms of their absolute value, but relative to a specific salient status quo, which is often known as the reference point. To think of an example of this, imagine you were to uh, you know, leave this webinar now and head outside and find that on your car right now you had a parking ticket. My guess is that you wouldn't think of that event in terms of your absolute net wealth. You wouldn't sort of think about your entire bank account and subtract however much the parking ticket was. Um, what you would do is just you know think, ah, you know, some expletive and you know, may have a parking ticket. You sort of think in terms of the status quo, which is sort of time zero, no parking ticket and then the parking ticket would seem like a loss from that point. This is reference dependence in action. And the parking ticket example also illustrates the second point, which is, uh, or the second bias, which is known as loss aversion. This idea that changes in the negative direction seem to be emotionally a lot more meaningful to us than similarly sized changes in the positive direction. Uh, this can get quantified by people working harder to avoid losses than they do to seek out equally sized gains. And this can actually lead to what Kahneman and Tversky noted was a kink in the curve in which people are actually working harder to deal with losses than they are to seek out equally sized gains. And it can even lead to what I'll call the third bias here, which is known as the reflection effect, 
this uh, particular effect that you saw across those two scenarios where people become more risk-seeking when they're dealing with losses than they do with gains. And the reason that people become more risk-seeking is that they like options in which they would get no loss. They like to avoid a loss completely, so much so they end up taking on more risk than they would normally like. And so these are these three biases in action. You can see them in these sort of standard psychological surveys, but it's worth noting that you can actually see them out in the real world as well. So for example, a lot of economists have pointed out that there seems to be a very funny bias uh, in terms of people's investing that you can see out there in terms of real behavior. And that bias is that over time, stocks have historically had a much better return rate than bonds. Yet for that return rate, people have disproportionately invested in bonds over stock. This is what's known as the equity premium puzzle, and it's bugged economists for a long time. Why are people disproportionately investing in something uh, that seems to not give as good a return over time? And the reason seems to be because of loss aversion. Stocks, on average, are earning you more money, but they also are much more volatile than bonds. And they, they tend, stocks tend to dip more into the red than bonds do. Uh, as a, as a critter that's loss averse, you might actually try to avoid those losses, those events of going into the red so much that you end up investing in something that you know, stays in the black but doesn't give you nearly as much of a return on average. So that's the equity premium puzzle, the spot where we see these biases creep in. There's also lots of evidence to suggest uh, that we see the same kinds of biases playing out in the housing market. Um, people's house value is probably based on some absolute amount of what it's really worth in a particular environment, in a particular location, and so on. But people also have very salient reference points when they think about their houses, either what they bought it for or what it was worth in 2006, and so on. And it turns out that people uh, whose reference points are higher than their current value of the home sometimes end up holding on to these houses longer. Um, they end up doing things like, you know, cleaning things up and putting new additions on, rather than just dropping the price, which might actually increase the amount of a house's sale. And so the claim is that things, phenomena like reference dependence might be playing out in the housing market, where people are holding on to houses longer that are losing in value the most. And this can lead to this kink in the market where houses aren't getting sold um, as quickly as they like, perhaps in part because of reference dependence. My favorite example, though, of these kinds of biases playing out in the real world is the fact that it seems like these biases also play themselves out on the golf course. Um, those of you that are golfers probably know that the best thing you could do to win at a game of golf is to get absolutely the lowest possible score. However, golf also has a very salient, but yet irrelevant, reference point, which is par. Um, a group of economists at Wharton Business School decided to look at whether or not PAR functioned as a reference point and whether or not uh, putters shot more riskily if they had the option of losing and going over PAR or kind of losing relative to their reference point. And what they found was, in fact, that's exactly the case. So people who had the possibility of uh, going over PAR, which feels like a loss, ended up shooting more, putting more riskily, whereas those who for sure knew they were going to be under par ended up putting too conservatively. Uh, these economists actually were able to estimate the amount that loss aversion and reference dependence uh, cost golfers on the PGA Tour, and the estimate was uh, just over a million dollars. So big stakes, um, lots of real world scenarios where we see these kinds of biases. The question we were interested in was whether or not we could see the same sorts of biases uh, in our capuchin monkeys, in their token economy that we just taught them. And so to test this, what we tried to do in, in one of the studies, uh, the one that I'll tell you about today, is actually just to give the monkeys pretty much the same scenario that I just had you guys play on, the scenario in which we're giving them choices uh, between individuals who are giving either gains, as in the first scenario, or losses, and individuals uh, who are either being risky or being safe. And so. I'll first tell you about the condition in which we gave the monkeys access to gains or bonuses. This was a situation in which we introduced the monkey to two new traders, Vlad and Wesley. And the monkeys seemed to would, would first start by thinking that they would get one uh, grape from each of these two traders. But the traders actually end up both giving bonuses. Vlad is a safe bonus. He, on the left, actually always starts with one grape. But every time the monkey trades with Vlad, he adds a single grape to give the monkey two. So he's sort of a safe bonus, um, kind of like getting an extra $500 with certainty. Wesley, in contrast, is actually risky. Sometimes he gives the monkeys uh, no bonus, but sometimes he actually adds a lot of food to give the monkeys a bonus of three. 
recipes like having, you know, flipping a coin and, and getting either a big bonus or no bonus. And so this was the monkey's choice. They were introduced to uh, Wesley and, and Vlad and how they play. And then they got the following choice. They could trade with Wesley for a safe bonus of getting two every time. Or they could trade, sorry, trade with Vlad for a safe bonus of two every time. Or they could trade with Wesley and get a risky shot between no bonus uh, and a big bonus. And what we found consistently across monkeys is that, like humans, uh, the monkeys actually tend to play it safe. Uh, they tend to go with Vlad taking the small, safe bonus. So this could, again, just be that maybe the monkeys are kind of risk averse. Maybe they avoid experimenters who give them risks. And so we gave the, the monkeys a different set of traders to trade with. Um, this time, these traders weren't giving the monkeys bonuses. They were actually both giving the monkeys losses. They were both taking the food away. And we always joke in the lab, nobody likes to take food away from the monkeys, but you know, we have to do this for science. Um, but so the monkeys get introduced to these two new traders. First, Alex on the left. Alex looks like he's giving uh, three grapes, but he's a safe loss, which means that on every single trial, he takes one of the grapes away and gives the monkeys only two. So that's Alex. The monkeys also get to meet Venkat. He, too, is a loss, but he's a risky loss. Sometimes he uh, takes none of the food away, and there's no loss. And sometimes he takes a lot of food away to give the monkeys only one. And so that's the monkey's choice between losses. They could either take a safe loss from Alex or a risky loss from Venkat. And what we found overwhelmingly uh, is that monkeys, like humans, uh, when they're dealing with losses, prefer to take a risk. Um, for those of you that want to see the exact data, here's just a graph um, of the monkey's choices. I'm plotting how often the monkeys choose the risky experimenter. Uh, the bonuses or gains, that first scenario is in blue. And the losses, the second scenario, is in orange here. And you can see the monkey's choice across the different monkeys. And one of the things to note is that we actually see some pretty impressive individual differences across the monkeys. Um, people often want to know who this first monkey is over here, who's uh, consistently risk-seeking. That's actually Felix, who's our alpha male. Um, so he's risk-seeking all the time, which is sort of interesting. Uh, but the important thing to take away from the graph is that all of the different monkeys, no matter their preferences, are more risk-seeking when they're dealing with losses than when they're dealing with gains. Every single monkey we've tested so far seems to show this framing effect. And so coming back to where we were before, the question we started with was whether or not we could see evidence of things like economic biases in our capuchin monkeys. And I think we're seeing some hints of some important ones. The first hint that we're seeing is that monkeys seem to be reference dependent. They don't pay attention just to the overall amount of food they get. They pay a lot of attention to what they start with and make their choices based on that. They also seem to be loss averse in the sense that they uh, pay attention to losses so much that they seek out more risk when they're dealing with losses than when they're dealing with gains. And that actually leads them to show a reflection-like effect um, in pretty much exactly the same framework as we see uh, in humans. So all this goes to say that we've seen a lot of economic biases uh, in the monkeys, um, ones that are very, very similar to what we see in humans. Um, so that's some of the published work that we've done on economic biases. Now I wanted to tell you about a slightly different uh, line of work uh, that we've been making use of the token economy to look at. And that's whether or not the monkeys show a different set of biases uh, relevant to how we evaluate different experiences. And so we're going to look and see whether the monkeys actually share experience heuristics as well. And I should point out that this is also uh, work that I've done in collaboration with my graduate student, Venkat, um, but also another former graduate student, Webb Phillips. And so here's uh, where these experience heuristics ideas come in. They're a set of heuristics that we seem to use to evaluate um, how events are going. And so the event that I've thrown up on the screen here uh, is a visit to my field site. This is why I can recruit so many students to come down and, and study monkeys with me. But uh, every time when I go to the field site, I get back and my colleagues will ask a very simple question, which is, oh, how was your trip? Seems like a very simple question, but if you think about how we answer this question computationally, it must be very complicated. You know, a week trip to my field site had a lot of ups and downs. How on earth do I calculate an average of how good it was? Am I taking a moment-to-moment -moment sample across the entire experience? You know, is that moment, you know, milliseconds or seconds? You know, how on earth do I actually make the calculation? What behavioral economists have, have taught us is that it turns out that people don't seem to be making the calculation in a way that you would ideally have designed them to make the calculation, it seems like our experience of events are biased in a few ways that you might not expect. And so just to see some empirical evidence of these biases in action, 
I'll tell you about one study uh, by Kahneman and colleagues where he had participants come in and try out two different painful events. So painful event number one was that the subject placed uh, her hand into this bucket of cold water for 60 seconds. It's 14 degree water, so it's experienced as very, very painful. So that's event number one for 60 seconds, uh, painful 14 degree water. Uh, then they would also experience event number two, where they would stick their hand in painful 14 degree water, so exactly the same as option number one. But then the temperature of the water would be increased ever so slightly so that it was up one degree. And the subject would require, the subject would be required to keep their hand in the bucket for 30 more seconds. Now, 15 degree water is also experienced as very painful, but slightly less painful than 14 degree water. However, I bet if you were to look at these options in advance, you might pick the one that had the least amount of time in actual pain. Seems like option two is in pain for one and a half amount of the amount of time um, as option number one. The crazy thing, however, is that when subjects were asked to recall the two different events and pick which one they would choose uh, to repeat themselves, they actually pick option number two this option where they're actually in pain for a longer amount of time. And so the question is, what's actually going on? And what Kahneman and colleagues hypothesize is that subjects have little access to the duration of the event they're experiencing. What they're paying attention to are small time slices in the experience, particularly the, how the event ended, its endpoint, which in the case of option number two was slightly better than that of option number one, um, and also the peak experience of the event uh, kind of the highest point of the event. The claim is that what people do is just to average those two points, ignoring completely the duration of the event, which actually leads to some funny cases where people actually prefer events in which they were in pain longer, um, so long as those events end with a slightly more positive endpoint. Uh, to see this sort of bias in action again, I'll tell you about another of Kahneman and colleagues' uh, studies, this time a real-world example of uh, people's memories of a painful medical procedure, a colonoscopy. So uh, for those that don't know, this is a medical procedure uh, where a probe is uh, inserted into a slightly painful orifice um, and the, it is inserted so that doctors can actually see uh, how this, this orifice is working, not a very uh, fun procedure. But it's especially not fun from the perspective of how it ends because typically the pain threshold, if you were to plot them over time, looks something like this where it begins as painful as soon as the procedure begins, but as the probe is inserted deeper and deeper, uh, participants are in more and more pain over time. And then as soon as the procedure is finished, the probe is removed, um, ending the event at kind of maximum pain. Uh, Kahneman and colleagues, based on their ideas of peaks and endpoints, suggested that a less painful or less remembered painful procedure um, might look something like this where uh, subjects are given the same exact procedure that they had before, but rather than take out the probe as soon as the procedure is done, you keep the patient uh, in pain in some sense for twice as long the amount of time, but you slowly remove the probe over time, kind of decreasing the pain over time so that it ends very well. Uh, they were able to test um, whether patients actually remembered these two events differently. And what they found, again, was that uh, when given a choice, uh, participants preferred option number two, uh, seemingly an option where they're in, in very physical pain for twice as much time. And so what's going on? Well, I've kind of alluded already to the two uh, heuristics that seem to be at work. The first of these heuristics is what's known as a peak end bias, this bias to attend um, to the peak of an event, it's sort of maximum happiness or maximum sadness, and also how an event ended. It is, this is known as a peak end bias. It seems like when we're evaluating events, we see, we merely average these two uh, evaluations together, and that gives us a sense of how the event went. So best kinds of events are those that end very well, a spot where the end and the peak are very high and they're at the same point. Uh, so that's the peak end bias, but the surprising other heuristic um, that we're seeing in all these cases is what's also known as duration neglect, just this idea that people aren't attending to a very salient property that you think they should attend to, namely how long they were in pain or how long they were in happiness across the event. And so we wanted to see whether we could start looking at some of these heuristics uh, in monkeys. This is new work, so we haven't looked yet at duration neglect, but I'll tell you some work we did trying to look at the peak end bias uh, in monkeys. And just as a side note, we, our monkeys are uh, very cute, and we don't like doing mean things to them. So we didn't do any painful events. Uh, we just gave them positive events. The positive event we gave them was uh, eating a new novel food. 
um, and the novel food we chose was Pocky. Um, for those of you not familiar with Pocky, uh, Pocky is a very delicious um, cookie, as I'll show you here. This is a sort of long cookie treat, um, parts of which are also frosted. So you have a delicious cookie in parts, and other parts are kind of covered with frosting plus cookie. So it's all the deliciousness of the cookie plus the extra deliciousness of the frosting. And so what we hypothesized was that giving the monkeys uh, the pocky, feeding it to them in the orientation with the kind of frosting plus cookie over here ending in just the cookie, that sort of event wouldn't be remembered as well as an event in which you kind of start with the cookie and then end with the frosting plus cookie. This would sort of be um, kind of an event of more overall pleasure. Um, and those of you who have eaten Pocky before, I hope you're eating at the right orientation. Some of us seem to be getting it wrong. But we gave the monkeys um, a choice of interacting with two traders who fed them Pocky in different orientations. Um, one did, just as I said, sort of fed the frosting first, which kind of ended on a not as good cookie note. Um, so we hope, expect that that would be a less good event um, versus another experimenter who fed the Pocky to the monkeys um, such that the frosting would last. And the prediction is that the monkey should um, remember the frosting last experimenter as better and shop at him more the next time. Um, and this is just uh, what we find at rates of about 63%. Uh, the monkeys choose to shop at the frosting last experimenter. So that's the case of preferring an experimenter who ends the event better. Um, what about preferring experimenters uh, who have higher peaks of their frosting? Um, and to do this, we kind of slightly modified the pocky. Um, giving the monkeys two uh, different options, one that had a kind of high peak of frosting, where there was a big blast of frosting uh, in the middle, uh, and another experimenter who had the same equivalent amount of frosting, um, but it didn't <coughs> occur in one big peak. So it's kind of half shaved. So there's a medium amount of frosting um, between each of the two things. Um, and I'm getting a question about the number of exposures. Uh, the monkeys each uh, had a session where they were forced to trade with one or the two experimenters um, across, I think, 40 sessions each, or 40 trials each. And then they were given a set of 60 choices across the two experimenters. So, um, so they had some exposure and then given the choice uh, days, just days later. And so that was the choice we get for the peak experimenters. Um, and what we find is that the monkeys also seem to show uh, the same preference as has typically been seen in people where the higher peak um, is actually preferred. Interestingly, the magnitude of these effects were a lot weaker than we'd seen in other economic biases. But the hints we're getting is that the monkeys are showing uh, phenomena that are really similar. And so all this goes to say that we're starting to see hints of other kinds of heuristics and biases in the monkeys, namely these experiential heuristics, really evaluating events in the same biased way as we see in people as well. And so it seems like they are showing things like a peak end bias, suggesting that they might be experiencing events uh, in a lot of the same ways. And so now I'll kind of jump to this question of sort of what all this kind of means together. And what I'd like to claim is a few things. What first is that we, with remarkably little training, our capuchin monkeys are able to pick up something like an economic exchange situation um, that models the kind of willing that models the kind of payment methods that we can use in humans. Meaning we have a sort of willingness to pay model in the capuchin monkeys. When we actually use these models, what we find is that many of the biases that we've seen so far in the human species, we also tend to see in capuchin monkeys. And this has allowed us to argue that uh, at least some of these biases might actually not be derived across primate evolution, but instead may be evolutionarily old. And so that's kind of claim number one, is that at least some of the irrationalities we see in the human species are shared pretty broadly across the primate order. And that tells us something about how these strategies work. It suggests to us that they're not merely linguistic in nature, as some uh, judgment and decision-making researchers had, had suggested when the uh, early kahneman tversky studies came out. Um, it also seems like they're not solely due to experience with specific economic situations. It's not just because we have credit cards and that sort of thing that we show these kinds of errors. Um, our read is that these biases might likely be evolved strategies. And that might tell us something about how tricky they are to overcome. Um, just to kind of give you a sense of where we're going with this, we're currently looking at all kinds of new biases, sort of rationalization effects, incentive effects, and lots of other errors. We're also trying to currently use the market to study other economic questions, such as, such as whether or not we can advertise to monkeys and change their preferences, and if so, via what stimuli and what means. We're also very interested in the question of whether or not there are economic biases 
uh, that are unique to humans, um, the kinds of things uh, that only our own species has. Um, but rather than talk about those, I bet they'll come up in questions, um, I kind of wanted to quickly end with uh, the kinds of tips I think we get from the monkeys. Um, sort of what have we learned about our own decisions from what we've seen in monkeys? And I think we've learned a couple different things. The first is that we might need to take reference points a little bit more seriously uh, than we might have thought before. And this comes from this idea that when you see biases that are really old, like our preference for sweet, fatty, delicious foods, they tend to be relatively hard to turn off. Um, the claim that we're going to make, my making today is just that when we see um, these kinds of biases in the monkeys, cases like loss aversion and so on, it might be that when we experience those stimuli in the world, you know, financial losses, you know, as in this photo, we might react to them um, as harshly as we would to these other kinds of stimuli. It might be very difficult to override our natural tendency to deal with these things. And that means we need to take reference points seriously and worry about the extent to which other individuals are using reference points against us. So how many times have we been faced with advertisements like this where the uh, company is very nice enough to tell us what the product used to be? The claim is that despite our cognitive abilities, it might be very natural for us to see this as a good deal. And so we need to worry a lot about um, how we're being affected by the reference points other people are telling us about. The second thing I think we learned from monkeys is that reference points are a powerful technique, but they have certain glitches in the way we, they operate. For example, we tend to get used to reference points relatively quickly. And that can provide a problem in which it's hard to kind of get off the hedonic treadmill, as it's talked about. Uh, as, as Edgar Watson Howe once noted, nothing is really wonderful once you get used to it. But we tend to forget that. You know, we tend to think that the first instance that we get, you know, a cool new gadget like an iPhone is going to be just as good you know, weeks in and years in. Uh, we you know, forget that with iPhone, but we might have had the same bias when we were dealing with the iPad or you know, other kinds of crazy gadgets. Who knows? The point is just that objects are the kinds of things we can get used to really quickly. Uh, today's reference point will be tomorrow's status quo. And this raises the question of kind of how we can get off this hedonic treadmill, how we can make uh, options wonderful over time. And I love this quote uh, by my colleague at Harvard, Dan Gilbert, who notes that wonderful things are especially wonderful the first time they happen, but their wonderfulness wanes with repetition. Uh, Dan notes, you know, the first time your, your husband says, I love you, or the first time your, your child says, mom, you know, it's fantastic, but you know, over time you kind of get bored and used to these things. And so there's this question about what we can do to kind of get off this hedonic treadmill, what we can do to make reference points. And I think there's a couple different strategies. One uh, is just to have variety in the, the things that we actually do. You know, you know implicitly that having you know five of the same ice cream cones over and over again uh, will make this fifth ice cream cone less good. It just becomes the reference point. You can actually break out of that by kind of adding more variety to your ice cream choices in your life. Variety is the spice of life, in part because it messes with our reference points. It actually pops us into new reference points, um, and violating the status quo in that way can actually be a help to our enjoyment of things. Second thing that can be a help to our enjoyment of things is varying the timing of things. Um, one thing we know is that over time, reference points get updated. But if you wait long enough, things might get better. You know, waiting only 14 seconds between the two ice creams might not be good. But over time, sort of breaking things up in terms of timing can actually make things better. And I think the best evidence from this is kind of anecdotal, is just that some of the best events in our lives are kinds of events that we don't have very often. You know, things like weddings or graduations, these are the kinds of things that you know, we think of as you know, the best days of our lives. You know, but if we had to do these things every single weekend, they probably wouldn't be as good. And so that's sort of the second thing that we can pop us off the treadmill. And I think these examples of uh, weddings and graduations lead to a third tip that we might get uh, for how to get off the treadmill. And that's the idea that we should be buying the right things. And things is the, opt is the important word here, because uh, actual things are the kind of thing that make it hard to get off the treadmill. We get used to things like iPhones and so on, but we don't get used to our events in the world, things like symphonies, the theater, going to the movies. These events are short-lived enough that they never become tomorrow's status quo. They're over before we have time to update our reference point. And that has led behavioral economists to suggest we kind of get more bang for our economic buck by actually uh, doing things, having events, rather than buying things.
So that was all the work on reference points. I think the third tip we get from monkeys is that because of the peak end studies, uh, we have to take our endpoints seriously. And that means that you can make things better by kind of ending on a high note. I think that's a fantastic thing about dessert and orgasms. They are all the kinds of things that make endpoints uh, even better. And that reminds us that the flip side of making endpoints even better is that you don't necessarily have to have uh, things that are long in duration. So a single bite of this delicious chocolate cake is going to be remembered as just as good as eating the whole uh, actual cake. And so you can kind of use this to have shorter uh, good events that are, that are better. Um, and by the same token, you can actually use this to have longer, maybe not as much fun events um, that can help you more. You know, so increasing the, your time on the treadmill uh, might be good just in the sense that however long you're on there, you won't actually remember. And so making bad events longer and getting them over with uh, is a good, helpful tip. Um, finally, the, the best tip I can give you is that we're now starting to understand how some of these biases work, and your best bet would be to use them to your own advantage. And if you need some uh, new tips, I would point you to the fantastic uh, book by Cass Sunstein and Dick Thaler, Nudge, where they document all kinds of ways to use your own biases to actually help yourself. Uh, instead, I will end with just one final thought, which is that I hope I've convinced you that studying where we are from is useful, um, and also that some of the densier strategies that we see in humans uh, might actually extend pretty broadly across the primate order. Um, and with that, I will stop, and just this is my thank you slide. I'm often the monkey on the right there who's getting all the hard work, um, and these are the folks who are doing all the hard work and helping me and funding me as well. So thanks. And now I think uh, I think Megan might come on to help me answer some questions. Yes. So I'm actually going to um, unmute everybody now. Um, okay. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to speak up. So give me one second. OK, so everyone is unmuted. So um, does anyone have any questions for Lori? Good. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah. I, this is Michael Sandstrom. And I guess I'll just jump right in here. Um, I, I'm actually interested in the extent to which the monkeys would seem to interact socially when they're watching these kinds of economic things going on. For example, if you had a monkey that was able to see an economic transaction take place, would that sort of be carried forward when it began to engage or does it sort of sit in its own world? Yeah, that's a good question. So I could see a couple different ways you could ask the social question. So one would be if the monkeys get to see um, somebody else trading and whether they would use that information to inform their own trades. Um, another would be uh, kind of whether they're interacting socially with the experiment or when the trades are happening. Um, because the monkeys do all these training studies kind of by themselves in their testing enclosure, so the monkeys live in a big social enclosure, um, they come out by themselves for testing, so they test by themselves. That means we don't have great answers to the question of how other monkeys' preferences affect their preferences. Um, it's actually something we're working on right now, trying to see whether the monkeys will actually conform to the choices of other monkeys, but we don't have the answer just yet. Um, but we do have the answer to the quote that Oh, sorry, I was going to say what we do have the answer to so far is that we do see the monkeys reacting uh, to how the traders trade with them. Um, and we sometimes see, particularly in the case of losses, the monkeys um, you know, sh showing sometimes frustration behaviors. Uh, in one instance, we actually saw one rejecting the food that he did get, or showing that he was sort of frustrated not getting the full amount of food that he expected. Um, so they do kind of interact socially with the experimenters during the trading in ways that suggest they're kind of and, and just, just further, if you were to leave some of these tokens around in their wild environment, would they consider them uh, valuable even in their own environment, or is it only within the environment where you're testing them? Of the human. Yeah, no, for sure. So um, that is also a good question. Um, it's, it's one of these kind of, you know, what happens in the refrigerator door when you're not looking, right? It's hard for us to measure if we're not actually there to see it. Um, what we do know is that when the humans are around, if they have access to tokens, um, they will take them. Um, so we sometimes see cases of, like, you know, what he's going to try and like, grab them outside our view or sort of steal them when we're not looking. Um, but it often happens. In, and so they do see that, tend to see them as something valuable when we're there. 
However, it's not entirely clear that the tokens gain value in the monkeys in the whole social group. Um, one of the surprising things that we saw was that the monkeys really easily pick up trading with us, with other humans, um, but they don't spontaneously ever start trading with each other. Um, mm. We haven't really designed a specific study to get at that, but it seems like they have their own system for exchange, which is based on their dominance hierarchy. Um, and this little token exchange we've taught them doesn't seem to pervade. So it's not as though, my guess, it's hard for us to know, we haven't done the right study exactly, but my guess is that if we just had the tokens there and the monkeys knew for sure no humans were showing up, the tokens wouldn't become valuable to them until the people were actually there. Uh, other questions? Um, I, I, I'm wondering, this is Michael Dwyer, um, I'm wondering if there isn't any developmental effects. Um, uh, some years ago, Suomi talked about therapy monkeys and how young monkeys could help uh, distressed monkeys feel better and so forth and so on, and it, it worked quite well with very young monkeys. I'm wondering if there isn't some sort of age effect in learning. Uh, of course, you, you just said you didn't have that social dimension very well developed, but I, uh, I would think that uh, training monkeys in economic decisions by other monkeys might be uh, uh, informative about the, the development of these decision-making processes. Yeah, it's another really good question. Um, so what one thing we have, so one of the limits of this work is that we're limited by the monkeys uh, we have access to here at Yale. So we have um, a group of 10 capuchin monkeys, and we had uh, some younger kids, but not really the kind of developmental sample that would be best used to answer this question. Um, one thing we did see, though, is that when we started uh, these studies back in 2006, we started only with the adult animals. Um, and only later taught the trading to the kids. And mm -hmm. one of the things we've seen is that the kids actually pick up the trading. Um, I mean, the adults were pretty quick about it, but they seem to kind of get it even before um, they've, they've kind of seen, they've had direct experience with being reinforced for the trading themselves. Mm -hmm. So it seems like whatever exposure they do get to the tokens is actually helping them learn the whole exchange part faster. There's this question about whether or not they'd be learning the preferences from other individuals. Um, I agree it'd be a fantastic thing to look at. It's just tricky with such small sample sizes. I, I, I just need to add, it, it is so striking to me when you look at the history of Piagetian work, he, he first studied errors, cognitive errors in students or in children as a way of discovering cognitive processing. And then later you made the point that this was something independent of language development and Piaget himself uh, switch from seeing language as primary to cognition as primary. And, and you, in this modern developmental methodology, have sort of uh, paralleled all those early discoveries, you know. I just think yeah, it's, no, it's ter excitingly striking. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it almost surely is history kind of repeating itself. But I think, I mean, I think this it, is... In a different way, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, one of the cool things we get from the Piaget's legacy is this idea that, you know, and I think this is the kind of thing that primary researchers hear more about, is that, you know, yes, we learn from the animal successes. Yes, we learn from cases where they're similar to humans in terms of a lot of these uh, smarter cognitive capacities. But we also learn a lot, you know, when other animals make errors. Mm -hmm. Truly. Really. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I have one. Uh, this is Ralph Collini. Uh, it seems to me what what you've been demonstrating with the monkeys, at least, that um, you've accented the insight theory by Kohler and uh, mm -hmm. observation theory by Bandura. Um, I mean, was that your goal, or was that a happy coincidence, or were you looking to see if that kind of cognitive ability was happening? I wasn't quite sure the direction you were going in with the research. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of it really did start um, by really trying to see whether we could see straightforward judgment and decision-making strategies that you see in humans in the case. Um, I think by doing this work, we've actually uh, kind of revealed a lot more than, than we expected to do at the time. I mean, just the way they were able uh, to learn the token exchange, we, we did that just to kind of create a method that we could use 
Um, but even that is kind of interesting in its own right. So um, I agree as with most science, you, you start with one question in mind, and the work that you end up with might be interesting for lots of different reasons. So we for sure weren't trying to necessarily tap into those questions. Um, but you know, sometimes you learn things that we didn't expect to get started. If, if I can follow up, so is your plan to do the observational kinds of research with the younger monkeys to see if they learn by watching their the adults, which is a natural learning process for them in, in the in their natural habitat. Yeah. So we don't right now. We don't have enough of the younger individuals to do this at this site. Um, we are planning to develop similar economic uh, kinds of questions down at the field sites where we actually have access to lots of individuals that could do the developmental questions better. Um, but one of the things we are hoping to do is to now start just with the adult animals to ask whether or not they're learning specifically about the choices and preferences of other individuals. Um, so we have a set of studies um, built up now to start looking at whether or not the uh, monkeys, when they see, say, Felix are alpha male, having certain choices, whether they'll selectively follow those kinds of choices and kind of conform. Um, and in particular, whether they'll conform more to some individuals, say high ranking, high status individuals than others, um, particularly in the context of this token economy. So, uh, so we don't have the developmental population to ask that developmental question, um, but we're hoping to, do, to ask similar kinds of social learning questions just with the adults and at least see what we get there. I'm also getting uh, a question via my little chat window who um, asked uh, whether we saw similar risk-taking behaviors in the social interaction by the monkey who took the risky choices relative to chance. Um, so this was that uh, Felix, our alpha male, who I mentioned, who was kind of consistently risk-taking in his economic choices. Um, it's really tricky to say. I mean, so he's the alpha male, which means, you know, in terms of his social behavior, he ends up taking a lot more risk than others because you know he, he had to do something risky to kind of get to the top, as it were. Um, however, to really know whether social behavior correlates with the monkey's economic behavior, um, that would require doing an individual differences analysis, which probably you know we just, at the present time we don't have enough sample size to do. Uh, so it's right now it's just kind of a tantalizing suggestion. Um, the hope is that as we do more work at the field sites where we have bigger numbers. Um, we might actually be able to get more of that information. Um, there we have the possibility of correlating economic preferences with social behavior in a, in a real wild living setting. Um, and in collaboration uh, with Michael Platt at Duke University, uh, we're also working to genotype the monkeys at the Cayo Santiago field station in the hopes of actually looking at parallels not just between economic preferences and social behavior, but also economic preferences um, and different alleles. Uh, and so it's kind of an exciting line of work uh, that's, that's happening now. Um, and I got uh, one other question about uh, whether folks can look at the research now or uh, whether we should uh, wait for the results. Um, the studies I uh, talked about today, uh, you can grab off my website. All the economic studies um, are collaborative efforts between um, me, Keith Chen, and Ben Kat Lakshman Ryan on. Um, one uh, is published uh, in the journal JPE, and the other is in the journal of Experimental Social Psychology. Both of those are on our webpage. Um, we're currently in the process of writing up the peak end work, so you know, hopefully reviewers, fingers crossed, <laughs> will get that. Those results will be out soon. So, does anyone have any other questions? Um, I'd actually like to follow up on a previous question. I'm not sure exactly who it was that asked this, but um, I get the impression that because there may be this dominance hierarchy going on, that this um, very easy to take risks type uh, dominant male may have actually been thinking, look, I usually get access to most of the food back in the wild anyways, and so this it doesn't really matter as much if I don't get it by comparison to the ones who maybe don't have access to as much resources in the wild, maybe it matters more. I'm just curious how you might respond to that. Yeah, so 
Um, I mean, this is a, a tricky thing of like trying to figure out whether some of their risk preferences come from other things that they're experiencing. So say maybe you know, somebody got more food that morning like, you know, with their normal life, and that's why they're doing these risk preferences. The funny thing is that um, one of the things you, you often find in behavioral ecology when you look at animals' risk preferences is that animals tend to be more risk-seeking when they're in the worst quality. So in other words, think about a bird who must, you know, has to take a risk of where he's going to forage or else he's going to starve to death. In those kinds of situations, animals tend to be a lot more risk prone because kind of like unless they take a risk and, and win big, they're not going to make it. Um, and so a lot of folks are actually surprised by how risk seeking we see our alpha male being because they think, you know, he's 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 in such good condition, he's in such good state that he shouldn't kind of be in this loss frame of being really risk seeking. Um, but I kind of agree that it might be kind of what's going on is, is a little bit of what you're suggesting that, you know, when you're, you can afford to be risk seeking and get some things wrong, if you're kind of in good stead and very, very wealthy. Um, I've occasionally given uh, this talk uh, for groups of kind of business folks and bankers, and they often don't show the same results on that scenario as Princeton undergraduates. They tend to be very risk seeking, which might be kind of why they're in the banking industry. Um, mm. But, uh, but it, it does suggest that they might behave more like the alpha male uh, than what's expected. That's interesting. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I guess, Megan, I guess that's it for now? Or? Yeah, um, if no one has any other questions, um, I'll be sending out a uh, follow-up email shortly. Um, I'm going to include like a link to a survey um, that um, everyone can feel free to fill out, and it'll just help us um, uh, you know, frame our webinars going forward and anything that we can improve upon uh, would be greatly appreciated. And um, just once again, I just want to thank everyone for taking time out to attend today. And um, also a really big thanks to you, Lori, for presenting for us. No problem. Bye -bye. Thanks. Nicely done. Lori. Yes, thank you. Bye. Thanks all. Yeah, bye.